Did you know that all types of dispatch centers and network operation centers rely on well-engineered video displays to help track and coordinate events and resources? Hi, I'm John Paul with ICOM. Today, we have Dan Gundry of Barco and the host of Knock Your Socks Off with us. And we're gonna talk about radios in action and their contribution to event and resource management. Thanks for joining us today, Dan. Love to be here. Thanks for having me. Excited. I am so excited to talk to you because I've enjoyed your podcast, Knock Your Socks Off. I enjoyed our uh, conversation last week, and I really enjoyed our conversation that I had with your coworker last week out in Nashville, Dave Barletta. We could talk about all those things, but in the meantime, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, so I've been working in the mission critical command and control market for about a dozen years, first as an integrator, now on the manufacturer side, working with Barco, uh, who makes visual displays uh, and such for the command and control market. Um, passionate about the space, working a lot of different verticals, public safety, law enforcement, utilities, transportation, um, and you know, just kind of talking through What's important relative to communications, what's important to relative to content and information for operators is very near and dear to my heart. I had such a great time looking through the imagery that you've posted on various websites and in uh, other formats about the high tech designs that you've been implementing. And I guess I really want to know, how do you combine all of that visual appeal with functionality for any user? Well, that's a really big question. <laughs> and go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so I, I always think first it starts off by being curious. I've probably stepped foot in four or 500 different control rooms in my life. And I still ask a ton of questions in every single one, never taking for granted that the last EOC that I was in operates exactly the same way as the next EOC or one PSAP from one County to another PSAP from another County. Cause they might be different, right? Um, you know, a county that has a theme park in it, the, the next one over may have, you know, a, a, an old waste property from Bethlehem Steel or something like that. And they operate very differently. So being curious, asking questions, being patient um, and asking more questions. And there's a theme here of asking a lot of questions. I think if you do that right on the front end, your output on the back end will tend to be right more often than not. But I think also you need to be flexible in your designs. You need to understand that what a control room is facing on day one may be very different than it is on day two versus day three versus day 2003. Um, so I think those are some of the core principles. Um, you know, I, I think curiosity. And I also think that technology doesn't solve all problems. All it does is help put better information into the operator's hands, the people who are making those decisions. So the better informed they are, uh, the more comfortable that they are and alert that they are also speaks to, you know, a better, a, a, a better implemented control room technology or control room strategy. I, I would assume then that there are many, many pre-interviews, designs and redesigns. How aggressive do you try to be with that first design or are you still seeking clarity with your customer and, and their, their influencers? I think it, I think there's, there's grades of, uh, um, of, of output. Um, you know, I always equate uh, any project uh, that we're working on as a moving train, right? And when you're jumping on that train and, you know, the point and the, the speed and all that kind of ebbs and flows throughout it. Um, I've also heard a client of mine, which I really love is, is building the plane as you fly it. Um, you know, so I think there's lots of different ways that you can actually construct a, a plan in terms of how many iterations it go through. It all depends. I think if you do your job right on the front end, you're going to get it right 90% of the time. Um, I, I think that flexibility becomes important. Um, I also, you know, you know, consult with clients and tell them, you know, when we go operational is not the end of this project per se. It's just the start of another chapter. You've got to have those touch points. Uh, centers go through turnover. Um, the mission changes, uh, the, the, the threats that they thought they had yesterday are not the ones they're going to have tomorrow. So I think it's a living, breathing thing throughout. But I think up front, you try to get it as right as you can, as quickly as you can. 
You asked a question about interviews and surveys. I think those are really important. It's not just asking questions, but it's observation. Um, and I'm no expert when it comes to these spaces. There are definitely people that know this space better than I am. But what I see they, they the, what I see that they do really well are those interviews with the actual operators sitting in the chairs, not the supervisors or the managers or the person that's fitting the uh, flipping the bill, but the actual operators sitting in that space and observing multiple shifts. Because I think a two-hour window in any control room can be a really boring two-hour window or it can be a really active two-hour window. You need to have multiples of those to get a consensus opinion of what's going on. People, people do traffic patterns, right? What, what, where are people walking around in a control room environment? How are they cross-talking from operator to operator to get a sense of how people actually work their day in that space? That may talk to spatial planning. It may talk to things like intercoms and radios between operators. It can speak to a whole host of things. But, uh, you know, I'm giving you, you know, a high level you know, view of, of what these people do to put these plans in place. Uh, you know, we recently, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we traveled to Nashville, Tennessee for the APCO conference. And one of our customers visited us in our booth at the ICOM booth. And we talked about how we deployed our wireless LAN radios. Uh, in their uh, dispatch center. And and I, I was thinking ahead to this conversation and thought how wonderful it was to hear this great feedback so close to this conversation and how we, we heard, uh, along with their consultant, we heard their complaint or their problem, and that was that their staff wanted to be able to talk amongst themselves without tying up a radio channel, without picking up a phone extension, they wanted to be able to continue to listen to their radio traffic when they went on break, if they went to the lunchroom or they went to the uh, for for uh, uh, you know just to step outside to get some fresh air. They wanted to know what was going on and remain in contact. And I, I kept thinking about your telling me about these great great operation centers, whether they were PSAPs or uh, other network operation centers. And, and how the, the dedicated folks that are working there rely so heavily on data and staying in touch. And the more data they have, the more connected they feel, and the more efficient they are ultimately. So when I think about the intercoms or the radios, and, and in, in the case with ICOM America deploying the wireless LAN radio system in, in that dispatch center, I think, where do the various technology contributors come together and who's in charge? Who's the architect of that environment? Yeah, wow. So another softball question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Again, just all day long, I'll knock him out of the park. So I, I, there's a lot to unpack there. I think first and foremost, going back to the operator experience, what they're looking for is they're looking for situational awareness. They're looking to extend their situational awareness from their little desk where they are to wherever they may need to go within the suite, uh, within the, the, the center. Um, and, and that's all commendable uh, for sure. We want to keep everybody alert uh, and informed. And that's visual information, uh, but it's also audio information. And I would argue that, that, that both of them are equally important. We like to talk about one versus the other, but they are both equally important to tell the story. We are visual and audible people uh, and, uh, and, 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 and mammals. So that's, that's first and foremost. Your question about who owns the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the nucleus of that intercommunication of that situational awareness, I, I don't have a really good answer for you. I think everybody needs to be self-aware enough to know that our piece is but a piece. I think we all need to sit around that same table and help develop the concept of operations, the con ops for a particular control room. I think ultimately the owner of that space probably needs to take responsibility to make sure that uh, when we talk about bringing information in, that we're not just creating noise. Uh, noise can be data noise. It could be, it could be content noise, whatever the case is, because at the same time as all those operators sitting in chairs are very capable of discerning more data points. There's still such a thing as situational blindness and or situational overload. 
meaning I'm looking at too much stuff to make the forest for the trees, right? So I'm looking at too much information in order to pick out the speck of data, the speck of information that's going to make the difference between saving lives and or not. So, so when you're building these uh, operation centers and you do you generally partner with the the property owner or you know the 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 agency manager as well as the software provider and then who who are the other players i guess that that all sit at that table and contribute yeah so I, there's there's a number of people that can it always it differentiates between vertical markets um, but you, you need to have the stakeholders from the end users sitting around that table, which includes not just the practitioners in this space, whoever owns that space, manages that space, but they're supporting cast of characters, right? Network services needs to be involved. And usually it can be multiple disciplines within that. There may be a facilities component. There may be some other players as well. If it's an EUC for a municipality, for instance, you know, you're going to have emergency management people, but I would argue that you also need to have the other people in which they're going to communicate with, right? Police should be a part of that. Uh, ambulance and fire should be a part of that as well. So that, that's the end user side of it. On the implementation side of it, you will usually have a consultant and or consultants. Um, you may have a consultant specifically for your, you know, for your, you know, your E911 type of effort who may not be the same person who's going to do the physical build out of a particular command center. Um, you may have other consultants that are looking at other aspects, content management software, you said. Um, you may have an integrator who sits in the middle of it because they own all these different contracts to actually affect the work. Um, you, then you'll have manufacturers around that. So there's different players, different layers. Consultants definitely have a strong uh, play. They've got expertise. They've got the proof of performance. A really good integrator that's looking at it through the right lens um, that also is going to survive uh, the relationship beyond the project, meaning service and support, because these are 24-7. When the fit hits the shan, they need to operate. So you need to have a good support structure behind you. All of those different ingredients play um, in, in, a, in a control room project. Well, I think I've certainly uh, thrown enough hard pitches at you, curveballs, if you will. Uh, I'll try to take it easy on this one. We've, uh, we've, we've talked previously about various operation centers and PSAPs and ultimately they're the same uh, deployment, right? Whether it's a 911 PSAP or a utilities operation center or an airlines control room, at the end of the day, it's usable data on the screen. It's what am I missing? What else goes into that magic formula? Well, the first thing I think is the is the right lens relative to um, the technology. So I always advocate that the technology in a control room should be for the benefit of the operator sitting in the chair, right? Any technology that you deploy inside of a control room should make that operator more alert, more effective, and more responsive. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Furniture, right? So behind me is a command and control console right? That is not something that you'd get from office supply store, right? That's purpose-built technical furniture that's built around 24-7 command and control types of environments. So it starts there. And they look at things like ergonomics. They look at things like human factors, arm reaching, uh, sit stand in order to keep people alert, the right kind of chairs for the environment to keep people comfortable as well. Um, but then you start looking at the video wall or overview displays, because it doesn't always have to be a video wall. It could be a couple of distributed displays that are showing, uh, you know, call uh, center statistics, uh, maybe some weather maps and what have you. So I think the overview video wall, and I always use overview because operators are work working task level in front of them, but you may have some ancillary disp displays that are showing common data. That becomes important. Um, the content then becomes important. Audio is key in a control room and usually one of the most overlooked aspect, whether it's radio communications, which is really important in a lot of those markets, whether it's alarms that are coming off of different software and or hardware packages, whether it's things like gunshot detectors, shooter detection systems that might in fact law enforcement, that might in fact private security. Um, you've got aviation that's got all of its audio alarms and bells and triggers as well. So audio becomes really important the video becomes important, and then the automation 
of all of that comes in. Again, if I'm looking at all nowadays, cameras are a dime a dozen. I can put them anywhere and people do right now. I used to be able to look at all 50 of my cameras at one time and I could see what was going on. Now I've got 5,000 of them. I can't look at 5,000 cameras. I need to automate that. So I'm looking at the right information at the right time. And then the correlation, when I get a gunshot detection system, can that system tell my video management system to pop open a map that shows where they saw the triangulation along with perimeter cameras in order to give me a fuller picture of what is actually going on? Can it actually dispatch operators as well? Can it open up a communication channel automatically so that we're automatically in the moment responding to that incident? All these are questions. All these are possibilities with today's, you know, connectors and platforms and what have you. It's just a matter of how far do you want to take it? And those are very individual questions for the different, uh, you know, control room operators and supervisors to, to, to ask themselves. We've spoken about network operation centers and PSAPs. What are some of the other types of uh, maybe a, we'll call them a smaller environment, no less important, uh, no less uh, significant, but a smaller environment uh, operation centers have you experienced uh, in your deployment times? We see control rooms of every size and shape in every corner. Uh, I would argue that while our industry and what you see out there in movies and stuff like that shows the really large control rooms, they show virtual reality in the Hunger Games Game Masters control room and Minority Report and, the, and NASA's control Wait, room. Wait, you mean that's but, not all real? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's what I do every day of the week. Yeah, I don't know what we're talking about. But actually, most control rooms have less than four operators. Most control rooms have two or less operators. I would even argue that a nurse's station inside of a hospital environment is a small control room environment. They've got three to six monitors. They've got two or three different networks that they're connecting into, right? Because my patient data network shouldn't touch my corporate network, shouldn't touch my nuclear medicine monitoring network, shouldn't touch my, you know, infant security. Yeah, people try to steal babies. It's freaking insane. But yeah, so all these are separate networks out there that, an op that a nurse might be monitoring. That's a mini control room environment where they've got one keyboard mouse. They've got multiple monitors up there. They've got to have an ergonomic work condition because we can't have the nurses falling asleep when they're taking care of patients. All of those things potentially apply. Um, so control rooms come in every shape and size. Uh, and there's more of them emerging on a daily basis. The concept of monitoring social media for corporations didn't exist, you know, six, seven years ago. Um, patient logistics and patient monitoring became really important um, and prevalent during pandemic, right? So we're seeing these newer types of control rooms emerge. Um, Real-time crime centers, which were really reserved for major cities in the U.S., are now branching out into that second, third tier city because of affordability of systems, interest, government grants, et cetera. So uh, they're coming up every day of the week. I think a lot about the healthcare operation center, mostly because I think we all know how important it is that that nurse's station, like you explained, is, is it gets the data and the alarms that they need. And sometimes we forget that the monitoring position in that control environment is also the first responder, right? It is that nurse that has to jump up and run to the alarm. It is, it is uh, whichever staffer is close by that is going to help the patient when that alarm goes off. And we often forget when we hear about operation centers and PSAPs and things that, that these are, there are these smaller environments that are just as vital to our day-to-day -day living. So I think it's a great highlight. Thank you. Yeah, and you want to talk about workflow being all over the place and needing to be flexible, uh, a hospital environment and the flexibility uh, and the fact that you never know where your next emergency situation is going to come from. That that SOP it, is is got so many different branches off of it because of the possibilities on a daily basis. It, it really is the definition of mission critical. No, and I'm confident that uh, all of the healthcare workers out there are uh, are pleased with our with our uh, deferential conversation about their efforts. Uh, and we do uh, tip our hats to them. Where else do we see these network operation centers, especially these micro mini uh, ones? 
I, I've seen them in, in, in engineering and manufacturing facilities and even in schools. Uh, tell me about where you've deployed systems in, in academic environments, if you could, for a moment. Yeah, so I, I would put academia in the same world as I would just general campus security uh, as, as an overarching uh, theme. We were talking about healthcare a moment ago, and I was thinking about how different a healthcare campus is from, say, a corporate campus. And I'll explain that in a minute. And I'll actually use a, a university or even a K-12 campus as being closer to healthcare. In a corporate campus for security, we usually have some type of a perimeter. Maybe it's a fence. Uh, maybe it's landscape-based. Uh, maybe the building is the perimeter at that point, but we usually have some type of a security perimeter that when somebody gets inside of it, we know, generally speaking, who they are. And if they're not, they're a bad actor and we can take care of that and respond accordingly. Healthcare campus and education campuses, they're meant to be welcoming, generally speaking. They're meant for people to come in, healthcare specifically, but also education. We cannot necessarily monitor every single person that comes onto those campuses, especially in the university world where they tend to be very open, K to 12, and we've, we're learning over the years to be more locked down, to be more discerning of the people that are coming onto our, uh, onto our campuses. Nonetheless, there's very specific uh, SOPs and guidelines for each of those. Um, healthcare campuses being one thing, um, higher ed being another, and then K to 12 being different. So again, this kind of goes back to that original set thought that I had, which was even when you walk onto a school campus, you need to ask questions and be curious because you never know the challenges that they're facing versus another one. And I'll use another example to share this. Um, so Ivy League uh, University that I work with, um, when I was doing a walkthrough of them for a, a public safety control room environment, we were talking about cameras. And they said, well, Dan, we don't have any cameras that look onto our campus. A and that thought was foreign to me because every other university I'd work with had cameras everywhere, dorm buildings, parking lots. Um, common areas, the quad, gunshot detectors, all over the place. And they said, no, because we have so many different celebrities and kids of famous people that go here that they don't want, they want maximum privacy. So they don't want their little one, their teenage boy or girl that's starting to understand the world, uh, being caught on camera doing something that a normal college kid wouldn't mind being caught on camera, or at least not knowingly so. And I said, that's really weird, even at the expense of their personal safety. And they said, yes, I went, that just boggles my mind. So again, one university may have a different workflow for whatever weird reason that is versus another university. So no two control rooms and workflows will ever be identical. That's a really interesting story. I never thought that somebody would, would actively make the decision. Uh, but at the same time, maybe that is in itself a security measure. Yeah, for sure. Just at a different yeah, scale. We, we've been talking about all of these different uh, deployments, whether it's a hospital, a PSAP, uh, a utility. I think we even touched on railroads at one point, the type of uh, dispatch and uh, university versus a K to 12 environment. And, and ultimately this is all emergency communications, right? What it all comes down to is the day-to-day -day communications are critical to operations, but the equipment and the data has to flow, the equipment has to work and the data has to flow in an emergency communication situation. And, and what I love is that you have mastered this art or is it a science or is it a combination of the two? Uh, so that when, I think you said it earlier, uh, I like to use the expression, when the ship hits the span, we can uh, we can all be ready and and uh, we can put our our radios and all of our data into action. I know that you you did a, a pretty significant deployment down in Dallas not that long ago. I think you were talking about uh, blending in some amateur radio equipment into a deployment operation center or an emergency operation center. Where where do the amateur radio operators of the world contribute? to that environment. 
Yeah. First, I think it's 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 not just uh, I, w- I was using um, you know a, a real time crime center a scenario that we did down in Texas area as an example, um, but I've also seen it in the municipal EOCs that I work with and the statewide EOCs, uh, for instance, one here in Pennsylvania, um, where there are rooms that are dedicated to ham operators. Um, because it's still a frontline communication. It's still a reliable means of communication. You know, when the phones go down and cellular towers go down, radio is still there. Uh, that's proven in a number of different natural and, and or not so natural uh, tragedies that we've had uh, in recent past. Um, and in law enforcement and public safety have picked up on this. They picked up on the fact that that's how they're gonna get reliable information when all else fails. And so, you know, a real-time crime center or an emergency operations center for a municipality or state are going to have rooms lined up with active operators sitting there manning the the, the amateur radio band. I myself have spent a number of hours uh, inside uh, the amateur room as well as the emergency operations side of, of an EOC and found found the blend of data to be invaluable. And I think when you were talking about that uh, project down in, in, you know, we say Texas area as if it's a neighborhood. And uh, <laughs> I think you were in Dallas, but I'm not sure. Uh, the, the reality is, is that these, these are all forms of data that are coming into this room and they need to be filtered through in the amateur world, uh, an amateur radio operator who then has to, uh, take that data and give it to someone who's going to put it up on one of those big, beautiful screens behind you. As a huge fan of the greatest amateur radio radios in the world, I, uh, I, I have to say that uh, the folks at ICOM America are thrilled that those, those EOCs are still welcoming the uh, amateur radio operators into their, into their environments. So that's good to hear. I think you could argue, John Paul, that it is the most uh, valuable piece of information to some of these centers because it's real world, it's first responders, it's out there on the ground, um, and it's going to be one of the more reliable sources when all else fails. So I don't think it's just important. I think it's critically important. I've seen data reports of, you know, staffing a, a, an amateur radio operator at, at bridges that are out. Uh, at hospitals to just do head counts going in and out during emergencies. And it is amazing how, uh, how accurate the human intel is at that level. I'm grateful that you brought it up uh, uh, during our interview. What I, what I uh, would love to know more about is how we can come and tour a couple of these centers. We can talk about that at another time. But uh, I really, really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. No, so first of all, yeah, we can definitely get you out there in the world. Um, you'll just see that I get I get I get completely giddy uh, and overwhelmed about these spaces. I love control rooms, um, love talking about them, and so that invitation is open for sure. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I, I think, you know, just ending up on the note, going back to radio communications in a control room environment, uh, I do think that it is one of the most underserved parts of a concept of operations for control room environments. Uh, and yet it is the piece of vital information coming in and communications uh, two way uh, back and forth to those first responders out there in the field. So big, big believer and a big fan in what you guys are doing there at ICOM as well. Well, thank you. I do hope to get some radios into your hand so that uh, potentially you can play with them and integrate them into some of your test beds. And uh, hopefully they will knock your socks off and you can, uh, you can introduce those into your own world. Uh, Thanks so much for being here, Dan. Uh, Thank you for all the listeners for joining the show. Please follow us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Spotify, and Apple for all things radio and more episodes of Radios in Action.